remember we were talking and she was like, you keep saying scalable celebrity, but like, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? And I was like. You've probably heard of Lil Michaela, also known as Michaela Souza, a 19-year-old Brazilian-American influencer with millions of followers online. She's partnered with the likes of Samsung and Prada, but she's also not real. You might have also heard of the other digital influencers out there, whether it be Knox Frost, Ema, or even Olympio Hinian's doll, Quay Quay. Well, in today's conversation, we get an inside look into the origin story behind Lil Michaela, a virtual trailblazer created in 2016 by Brad. And we do so with Trevor McFedries and Isaac Bratzel. Trevor was the co-founder and creative genius behind Bread, while Isaac was the chief design and innovation officer. So he was actually in charge of creating the avatar and running the design and tech teams. So we get to hear firsthand what inspired this experiment, and also what early signs were showing that Michaela was not just a novel idea, but a character that people were really resonating with, even writing fan fiction about. And in an era where it's easier than ever to spin up a character, where does it all go? When an influencer can truly look however you want it to look, How do you decide? How do you create a narrative that resonates? How do you get past the uncanny valley? And what are the ethics of all this? We cover all this and more, and I'm truly so excited to have you listen to this conversation. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. It should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. For more details, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. It's 2016, and I just want to paint a picture for the listeners. Maybe you guys also need a reminder. 2016 was a very different era. Uh, Britain just voted to leave the EU. Rihanna just released work. OpenAI and TikTok were literally just founded like their absolute infancy stages. So again, we're in a very different world. And somehow, Trevor, you had this insight, this inkling that a virtual influencer like Lil Michaela should be created. So what what was the key insight at that time? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, I think. But the reality was, like much like you mentioned, we were living in this kind of heightened political moment, like post-Trump, post-Brexit. Mm-hmm. And me just being terminally online had kind of spent these different evolutions from like web one to web two uh, into like web three or this kind of like the present and seeing these different media moments and the narratives they could create and and how that could kind of like shape the ideologies and belief systems of young people, especially. And, you know, being in the States was hyper aware of like what happened on 4chan and, you know, what was happening on social and meme magic and what it meant to create narratives that could, you know, capture heart and minds and, you know, how effective those could be and the double-edged sword that presented and, and kind of in parallel I, I had kind of fallen in love with the, with this this data set around a show called will and grace that i love that said mm-hmm. that like will and grace was largely responsible for gay marriage in the u.s that like public polling was tied to the ratings of that show and so it seemed like there was an emergent new media um social you know uh, instagram other kind of like visual platforms that could be used for telling fictional stories and that was really the dream. It was like, if you were going to build a modern Disney or Marvel now, you probably wouldn't want to start in, in comic books or, or in theaters. You'd want to start where the eyeballs are, which was, you know, really on social. And so that was a vision. Yeah. It was like, can we create Disney on social? Can we tell stories that are as engaging as a Kardashian or a Jake Paul, but kind of imbue the, the, these ideologies that make for a more tolerant, empathetic world? Yeah, totally. I mean, I love that you mentioned some of these other characters or influencers that we see in TV shows, for example. I love this idea of Disney's for social. Like people have shown that they have an affinity to not just humans, but characters in TV shows and these illustrated characters. But was there some sort of insight that you saw where, to me, I don't know if we saw very many virtual influencers that looked like humans. What was the insight of like, well, Michaela is fake, but she also looks super real she was like almost like a new breed you know what i mean yeah uh i mean there were there were like zero uh, and that's largely mm-hmm. why like isaac is in the picture i mean like no one was doing photorealistic like bipedal human characters there's this yeah. concept of the uncanny valley that you know mm-hmm. there is this kind of middle ground between what an actual human likes and what like a a, a cartoonish looking like hello kitty human looks like where it looks yes. too human but not human enough and you get freaked out 
It's like a Polar Express <laughs> girl is often cited in this stuff. But as a result, you didn't really see anyone doing any of that stuff. And, and you know, there were things happening in Asia. Hatsune Miku, you know, we're standing on mm-hmm. the shoulders of giants like Miku. But yes. we were interested in, I think, doing something, A, on social. And that was already going to be challenging a lot of norms. Like there was still this perception that social media was for nonfiction. You know, we're telling a mm-hmm. fictional narrative inside of that space. And be doing it with with a character, and if you minimize as much of the, the novelty as possible and keep as much of it familiar as possible, I thought we had a better chance of succeeding. And I thought it would be really easy. I was like, "Yeah, we can just make a book with human, no big deal." <laughs> and insert six years later, you know, trying to figure it out still. But Isaac really was like the, the, the really the key in getting that figured out. Yeah. So Isaac, let's hear from you. You get this. <laughs> This idea from Trevor, you're like, okay, let's just make this virtual human and you have to make this a reality. So I want to talk to both of you about two things. One, the design, like all of the decisions that you had to make about exactly what she looked like and then also the narrative. But Isaac, like talking about that that design and actually making this real, what were your first steps and like what are all the little things that maybe sound simplistic, but maybe were actually really hard? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always really hard, but I think we got lucky in a lot of ways um, in terms of Michaela's design. One is we had a CEO and Trevor who actually dove into some of like, he found Daz 3D and these softwares and kind of like started making that design. So when I came mm-hmm. in, it's really just like taking that, like looking at what's kind of working already and saying like, okay, now let's turbocharge that. Let's make this able to be look realistic. Let's make it able to be animated and all these other things, right? So mm-hmm. I think for us, it was a little bit of like having a, a really good sense from from Trevor and from some of the cultural um, savants we had on the bread team that really understand internet culture and kind of like how to connect with with the audience that they were targeting, right? And uh, you know, luckily we found something that obviously resonated with a whole lot of people. Yeah, and it, it really did resonate. And I've heard Trevor, you talk about again all of these little decisions that you had to make about exactly what she looked like. I mean, when we're influencers online as ourselves, like y- you only have the face that you're born with. But when you're starting new with a virtual influencer, you literally can make that influencer look like anything. And that's like amazing because you have this clean slate, but it also is like, yeah, does she have freckles or not? Like how long's her hair? What race is she? How old is she? What are her beliefs? And so given Trevor used the term terminally online and sounds like you still are, how did you use your your background. I mean, you also worked at Spotify. You've like toured with Katy Perry. Like you have this cultural understanding of what people like and how did that feed into ultimately what you built into this character? Yeah. It's an interesting question because when you're doing things like this, it's so open-ended. I mean, the the other idea is like Michaela didn't need to be a fixed uh, aesthetic or character. It could be this kind of like Mm -hmm. shapeshifter ever evolving, Uh, you know, in the narrative, Michaela's 19 forever. And so there were decisions like I wanted to create constraints because as a creative person, I like having constraints. I think it kind of like breeds really like interesting ideas. But, you know, some of the kind of early things, you know, I had worked in like making music as an artist and as a producer for a very long time. And it was like pretty clear to me that there were these like underserved, really passionate audiences in Latin Mm -hmm. America. And so, you know, if you ever look at some like pop stars, Instagram, 10% of the comments are come to Brazil, come to Brazil, come to Brazil. Oh, really? And so... (laughs) You know, so in the narrative, I definitely wanted to like engage, you know, young people, especially people who spoke Portuguese. And so Michaela, you know, was programmed to be like half Brazilian, half Spanish, right? And mm. like the idea that we could engage, you know, kids that I think were underserved by influencers who, who were kind of looking towards Europe and kind of like Western Europe, Western Europe especially. Beyond that, I think like, you know, the age thing, I'm a big fan of pop culture. And I think generally have kind of seen this motif where, people engage with media that it's like five to seven years older than them. So like, you know, Hannah Montana is, is running around high school, yeah. but it's, it was like kids that were like middle school and younger watching that program. And so Michaela being 19 was quite intentional because I really felt like, you know, in a post PG 13 America, like movie ratings really neutered uh, kind of like middle ground of cinema and, and, and television where I used to have these kind of like John Hughes films, these like coming of age tales that really talked about the issues that like people were facing and didn't talk mm-hmm. down to them. And so one thing we always talked about early on was like, we wanted to tell stories at like eye level. Like we didn't want to talk down to kids. We wanted to address them like they were adults and they had yeah. complicated lives and they have, you know, they're aware of the turmoils in the world. They're well aware of like impending climate change. They're well aware of like economic <laughs> strife. Like, pandemics yeah. like these issues affect everyone it's it's not just you know cliche saved by the bell motifs like we can we can go deeper 
And then beyond that, like we just made assumptions about what narratives would work and how we could kind of imbue these ideas of, of tolerance of like otherness. And then you just try things. You know, I think people were probably like, wow, how did you know that she'd be so revered in fashion? And like, I had no idea that, you know, <laughs> we want her to look cool. And all of a sudden fashion raised their hands. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about the narrative that you built out because it seems really critical to the success of Loma Kayla. But also, like you mentioned, you, you were surprised by things. Like, What were some of those early signs where you're like, oh, wow, we've got something here? For me, I get kind of like theory brained and I'm like talking about these like concepts and ideas that I'm really excited about. And often they, they don't apply in the real world. But I talk a lot about this idea of like parafiction, this idea of like mm-hmm. telling fictional stories and spaces reserved for nonfiction. And the big one being like, professional wrestling, WWE, whatever it is. Yeah. This idea that you're watching people in a ring where you watch sports take place, boxing, other things, and people are getting hit with chairs and they're really getting hit, but you're told that it's fake. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. and like in, in a kind of an infinite scroll world where, you know, nothing makes you take pause, these mm-hmm. things that kind of disrupt these patterns that you're familiar with, like make you pause and like say like, what's going on? And so, so, so much of what we were doing was really trying to like create these parafictional moments where you're like, wait a minute, Michaela's at Coachella? Is that really Coachella? <laughs> wait a minute. Like a brand is talking about her being at Coachella and that lets yeah. credibility to the idea. And so the moments that I think that, you know, for me that jump out obviously was like Shane Dawson. Um, when Shane Dawson made this YouTube video that included Michaela in these conspiracy theories, <laughs> about what she could be like that adds this other kind of like meta narrative layer to it right that it then kind of like yeah. compounds like the reality of it all and so that that stuff was like really special to me and quite fun and quite cool and Isaac do you have memories of things that really jump out yeah I, I 100% agree the Shane Dawson one was really cool and I think it was any time there was a thing that kind of made it real to me because for me the thing that I was always worried about when I got there was like is this just a reactionary thing? Like people see Michaela and on Instagram, they have a reaction, right? But when you could see fans really engage and like, so somebody would respond to Michaela and then there'd be a whole bunch of fans that would like come to her defense and like explain the whole story, <laughs> and, like, the Shane Dawson video and all these, and like, they had tracked on all this stuff. And you could see how much people really cared and were into it. And like, there were fans that knew more about the backstory than I did at certain points where I was like, oh man, this is really deep. Um, and then, yeah, the, the Coachella moment was huge for me because it was like a technological thing. And I was like, well, this is really real. Like, we're not just doing still images in, in magazines and stuff. Like, we're going to go in real time and try to inter- interview, like, musicians for Coachella. And, like, that was around the same time as the Calvin Klein ad and, and some of this stuff where we're like, okay, we're really trying to do something interesting now. Yeah, like, rehashing the trauma of those moments where we're just, like, working around the clock, trying to, like, do things that take, you know, 100-person teams years in just, like, a few weeks or months. It was totally mental i remember the ho- a couple of halloweens where there were all these fans dressed as michaela and, and one of the things we talked a lot about when we were designing the character was maintaining this halloween costume right like if, if you were going to be michaela for halloween are there identifiers people would know who you were and like the space buns the freckles like certain things like that were things that we try not to deviate from too much i think that was one of the brilliant insights trev had early on it's like people like recognizable like instantly because if we change it too much right you lose that kind of like instant recognizability so Michaela just like sticking with the space buns you know having the freckles like these just really recognizable features so I think that was really brilliant honestly yeah I think I've heard you talk about this Trevor but like it was this right balance between somebody that almost anyone could resonate with like people aren't even sure like exactly where she's from but then at the same time these iconic aspects where you're like oh i haven't seen that before so it's like a nice balance in her look but you mentioned fan fiction it's always fascinating to hear that like fans give the character a life of its own it sounds like this was the case tell me more about this narrative that you guys ended up building over years and also whether any of this fan involvement did that actually help you guys curve that narrative or adjust that narrative. It seems like it's easier than ever for someone to create one of these virtual influencers. And given that that may be the case, that like there's going to be this flood of them, how important is building a narrative in getting this traction, having people really resonate with a character like this? I mean, it's it's, it's all extremely hard, but I, I think narrative is, is, you know, like unthinkably hard, right? You know, there's, there's all kinds of books you can read about why you shouldn't build like narrative driven media businesses because you, you it's like building a fashion business. Like you have to keep things interesting forever. Like you yeah. can only keep lost <laughs> interesting for so long. Like the Sopranos runs out of steam or maybe not. That mm-hmm. show's not perfect. 
But I, I think, you know, one of the ways we tried to solve for it, or I thought about it was like integrating Michaela into the real world. And like, oh, this is funny, like thinking about a lot of these concepts, but like one of the things we had talked about a lot was kind of inverting the traditional media pyramid, where traditionally you kind of started with this like longer form asset, like a Star Wars. And then you kind of iterate in like a Star Wars video game, comic book, all the way up to like a lightsaber you could buy at Target. And so you have this pyramid that moves from like big, expensive, long form asset into this like smaller thing. We want to invert that and start with just like a character, a still image, and then work up that stack into like longer form television and film. Right. And the dream was to actually expand upon that like television and film. Like one of the reasons I love the Kardashians and like their narrative universe is that it's infinitely deep, you know, because they're human beings. You know, you can work through all of, you know, Kim's father, Robert Kardashian's OJ case into like his family tree, into like Armenian yeah. conflict. And Armenian, like you can go as far back as you'd like. And so by integrating Michaela into our world, by having her work for Brud or fire Brud or have, you know, these like real world boyfriends and other things, yeah. like fans could go super deep. And then they can start to speculate and they can riff and they can actually connect dots that we wouldn't see all the times. And so the other part of that was we really tried to build, you know, a, a technology organization disguised as a media organization. So we had like data science teams every week bringing back what worked and what didn't, building taxonomies on images and videos. Wow. Isaac, tell me more about that. You were part of the team that actually helped this come to life. Like, okay, Michaela's apparently now dating this one person like how do we actually execute on that and should we change it and i think at one point michaela was dating a real life person too right so there's all these like dynamics and yeah tell me more about like operationally how do you make that happen yeah i mean early days we were really small and it was crazy fun we try to do things that were just like way beyond what a team of that size and <laughs> experience level is like you know sh should be trying to do but i do think you know trevor's earlier point like this really quick feedback loop between like when you're starting off you have the ability to like do this quick thing and get that reaction immediately and like you said steer that character and her narrative to the fans that are engaging right which then informs what you're going to do when you start to do more medium and long form stuff and i thought that was a really cool thing that i learned from Brud. it's kind of this reverse pyramid that trevor talks about it's like if you start with a movie you're kind of like here's a script we're going to take a shot and see if it lands all right and if everything hits perfectly then maybe you go from there but this is almost like, let's introduce this character super early in the lowest form possible and see what resonates and what what hits and kind of build the story out of the, the fan engagement, which is just like kind of this radical idea. At least it was to me at the time. I had never really seen that. So using that then to inform the longer form content and kind of like having this pretty good idea that, okay, this is going to work now. So now we can go and try to create, you know, a five minute music video out of a real time character, which is, it's, 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 <laughs> that was its own whole challenge. So. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how do you create that? I, I guess today the technology is getting better, but like what are the technologies that are going into creating Lil Michaela and then not just Lil Michaela on Instagram, but these music videos? I think she's on Spotify. Like what technologies are you actually using to accomplish all this? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ones. I think that there's a huge, um, I would say, an order, ma order of magnitude difference between like the still images on Instagram and doing actual long form animated content, right? That's stuff that's typically reserved for really high budget films and, you know, triple A you know, games for like a hyper realistic digital human to be doing that stuff. So that was really challenging. I mean, I think we we broke a lot of ground there and the technology was coming along. So we were able to do it somewhat, but like we're now in a phase where it's starting to become, I think you've been referring to this stuff that it's, it's starting to become more and more realistic for smaller studios to be able to do that. But it was still a blocker. You know, I think what we were really what we're hoping to do was somewhat blocked by the ability to like create really expensive like long form content of animated digital humans that are that's really expensive. So we want to make more characters and create more content and do all these things. Um, we ran to like, you know, you get stuck in a certain platform when you build out this technology piece, right? It's really hard. You can't have Michaela just go be in a, in a video game instantly. You can't just like go to HBO and Euphoria and be like, yeah, sure, here's Michaela, put her in your film. It's not easy like that. It's expensive and time consuming. And anytime we had those kind of opportunities, we had to weigh the opportunity cost of diverting our whole team towards doing that thing and like dropping Michaela's internal narrative. And I think that's, you know, that was kind of one of those big learnings for like, okay, in order to see all this thing, we really would have to have a big, big investment to like get over this bottleneck at this point in time. So did you end up getting over that bottleneck? Because I think you did end up launching a few other influencers, Bermuda, Blocko, like what was the, the next steps or how did you decide, okay, yes, we are going to expand this past Michaela. We are going to take on some of these really cool opportunities and invest in doing these longer form video narratives. And so, yeah, like what, what were the next steps past that early traction? 
Yeah, it's funny. I'm thinking back to kind of like original pitch stuff. And, you know, I think initially it wasn't clear to investors like how this could be a venture size bet. But like the bet to me was always like, okay, there's a coming computing shift. I called it spatial computing. I guess it's probably mm-hmm. best now, like the metaverse or whatever else. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it seemed like all of the people that were building for the metaverse were building kind of universes and expecting people just to show up. If you build it, they will come. And I always thought mm. that like a character would pull you into emergent platform. So like, you know, Pikachu is the reason you get Pokemon Go. You know, you don't want to just walk around your yard scanning stuff. You want to follow Pikachu somewhere. And so like if we kind of build a connective tissue between, you know, Web2 and this emergent spatial computing thing, we'd be, we'd be way out in front. And I think looking back on it now, the things we kind of got backwards, or I got backwards was I was like, okay, billions flowing into VR and autonomous vehicles. And we're going to have this huge shift. that's going to allow, you know, generative media to come really quickly. And then once we can do that really quickly, a lot of value is going to shift to this like spatial computing world and we're able to build digital economies. And I think COVID accelerated digital economies before we actually had the, the, these, these tools to do generative media like, at the pace we'd like. And so we had to make decisions about where we could be efficient and how we could build models that could port really well. You know, so it's like cheeky things like the, anyone can kind of do a digital human that looks good and wants to image, but like speaking, you know, building really compelling facial rigs that can be driven effectively, super tough. Isaac's really good at it. It's insane. You know, Blocko was like, what if we just covered his mouth all the time? You know, it's like simple things like that where he's always wearing a mask, he's always covering his face. It adds a little bit of mystery, adds some narrative, adds a constraint to the creative people, but it allowed us to create stuff pretty more efficiently. So it's like little things like that. Feet are hard, they often are floating. Let's not show feet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like hair is crazy difficult. So yeah. Blocko is bald, you know, Michaela's hair is pretty much fixed except for a couple of things that move. Like let's really limit it, limit things that could cause us a lot of problems. And Trying to figure it out from there. That is fascinating because I mean, with just like the generative AI stuff today, it's like the the trope is like the hands. You know, everyone's like, "Oh, don't look at the hands. Always hide the hands." And so, Isaac, <laughs> are there other things where you're like, "Yes, uh, there are things that people who have not ventured down this rabbit hole, who have not built this, don't know is actually like surprisingly hard." Yeah, there's so many things. I think one of the things that anytime we're outside of a technology, we have this idea that computers you do one plus one equals two and computers are always going to do that thing. And there's nothing farther from the truth when you get into this stuff, everything Mm -hmm. breaks, everything crashes. This is why, you know, you have big studio models to get, you know, these high end like budgets that just go crazy expensive because at the end of the day, you have to get it pixel perfect to fit into this film, to fit into this universe, like exactly right. And it's just the only way to do that is throw time and money and people at the problem. What we are trying to do is like the lowest scale possible. We're doing this on social media. We can get to 90% quality, right? People are not going to care if like this one flyaway of her hair is like slightly not quite right, right? So we're like, how can we just like eliminate 90% of the cost and the time and get 90% of the quality, right? Because it's kind of that power law inverse. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's just, it's just so complex and so hard. And even today, I think one of the things we're going to run into a lot is this idea of like, oh, anybody can do this now with AI tools and everything else. And to me, it feels a little bit like suggesting that it, because Ableton is like $5 now, anybody can go be a superstar musician because they have this this technology. And like technically speaking and like having the skill set to do it, it's not true. And then definitely narrative and culturally and having the like ability to like connect with fans that way, it's definitely not true. You know, the technology piece is going to be so enabling. And my hope is that it will really help people that have that ability and that desire to connect and tell these stories. I really like, I resonate so strongly with Trevor's kind of vision of like storytelling being transformative. And I think that that's so true and t- today more than ever. I think if we were five years later with Michaela, we would have been able to do things that would have been like much bigger and even broader because I think a lot of the bottlenecks are going to be removed very soon. Yeah. I love that you said that, that, you know, the technology is a democratizing force, but I can also see how people will look to little Michaela and be like, oh, I couldn't do this six years ago, but I can do it today. And so on that topic, like, are there any, I guess, any wisdom from your like six years of of doing this and building this and seeing what works, what doesn't work, how much harder it really is to get traction, to get people to care about something that you would almost like tell those people not so much to drive them away from this idea, but to to understand what it really takes. There's kind of no easy way to say this but like if democratizing force and all this technology lowering barriers just meet participants and so effectively if you're creating media on tiktok right like you're not even competing for attention in your in your following or your social graph like you're competing against the globe you need to have 
something more compelling than tens of millions of people that are generating stuff. And so it's super hard. You know, one of the things I tried to do is like understand where you have advantages and, and where you have kind of like where you have an edge. So for us, it was music, right? It, like, like, you know, maybe if 10,000 people are releasing music on Spotify this Friday, can we be in the top 100? Yeah, I think knowing where where you're where you're really gifted and where you can outcompete others because it's it's hyper competitive for sure. Isaac, on the technology side, I just want to ask you super quickly because you're building a company here that enables some of this, right? From my understanding, your company is not taking the like full generative AI approach, right? Where you just like go into something like Midjourney and spin up a net new image. So how are you thinking about that? The different ways these new technologies are coming together? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think right now, I think that there's understandably a lot of excitement about mid-journey and really tools that I call pixel pushing at the end of the day. If you're doing 2D morphing of images, then I feel like if in a more immersive world, so if you use the dirty M word metaverse or spatial computing, <laughs> like, oh, like that 3D immersive world, when you create 3D avatars or 3D things, and 3D worlds, like they are fully immersive and they have like, they're able to now be interoperable within a a, more virtual world. And that's what I think is coming. Um, Not necessarily the metaverse in terms of like what we might think of it now, but just this, Mm -hmm. this world that's going to come more and more out of gaming where things are going to be more three dimensional. Um, And working in 3D for like a decade, you start to understand like how much we underestimate what another dimension means when you're adding it to something like especially technological, okay. we, we don't think exponentially, we think additively. So we're like, oh, yeah, you add that, that third dimension. And it's like, yeah, just another layer. And it's not, it's completely a whole order of magnitude shift. I also, I really like what Trevor said earlier, um, about rather than building like this metaverse worlds and focusing on that, but like focusing on the character and the narrative and having them be the connected tissue. I really view that as one of the ways that really some of this stuff can start to land, which is if we can create like, avatars that are scalable, like digital humans and digital people that can actually connect with fans in a real way and have that be the way that ushers them through this kind of more virtual world and create more of a human connective layer. That's what I think would be really, really cool. Because I think a lot of times, you know, if you look at what's going on now with a lot of the virtual world stuff, it just feels very impersonal to me. So I don't think that this is not including some of the generative AI tools. I think it's like the generative AI tools and the stuff you see image based right now is very, um, two-dimensional. I don't think that's actually going to be the solution. I think what it's going to be is when those tools are able to like really generate and, and include into like a three-dimensional world, which is something that we will be focused on. Right. So you're basically saying like a lot of these tools right now are in 2D. You think that there's so much more fidelity in 3D, but then there's also things on top of that, right? Like voice and the ability to animate the 3D character. But I, I guess as we do see more of these virtual characters, these people who are not as people say, not real people. How do you guys think this actually just changes our relationship with creators or influencers, I should say? Today, most people don't have the incentives to create a virtual influencer of themselves because, you know, again, they they didn't have access to the technology. It wasn't good enough. But as more of these characters come online, like, why would I want to put myself out there? Because I can be like a more beautiful version. I can change my voice. I can be, you know, I can, I can basically become exactly what I want to be. And I'm not constrained by like the physical nature of like what I was born with. I also can't be canceled, right? Like there's, there's these dynamics to like, again, like this clean slate. Do you guys see that being the case where with enough time, like, that is the reality where like most things that we see online are not quote unquote real. And then also how does that change our relationship with the things that we see online? I mean, I think we could argue about real and reality, you know, at the right? But like, we could, yeah. I look at my Instagram feed and it's a lot of like scripted pranks or things that are, you know, led to making people believe that are real. It's, you know, People that have been highly altered, it's situation and context that are presented as real, like yeah. staying on a private jet when you don't actually own that <laughs> jet. Okay, right. uh, and so I, I think I think the sliding scale of reality will, will, will probably continue to move in the direction it's been heading in. But beyond that, you know, the thing that I'm most excited about is is this kind of race to the bottom in a lot of media it is going to like that, that bottom's going to hit far quicker because of AI. It's going to be really easy to be good at things yeah good at making music good at making visual art good at you know creating content it's going to be really hard to be excellent and because you know models effectively are are, are backwards looking data kind of begets more data i think you're gonna have some like nasty feedback loops not entirely dissimilar Mm -hmm. from like what happened to netflix where they kind of woke up and one day everyone realized that 
every show was a chef's table for a different industry. And they're like, wait, I like this format. And clearly the algorithm said it works, but I don't feel, I, I don't feel like I've gained any nutrients from this. I've just kind of been satiated yeah. and I'm looking mm-hmm. for nutrients. And so I think we're going to have rapid ascent where things feel better on the surface. People are start looking for substance. And that's when I think the really special folks are going to rise to the top that can augment this technology with unique skill sets. Do you think that maybe sometimes people misunderstand or misalign substance with what we just talked about, like reality? Because I could see how people over time will be like, okay, my response to this, everything feels fake. I want, again, like things that are truly in like meat space. (laughs) Um, And that's what they look for. But to your point, just because it's in meat space doesn't mean it's like real and has substance. Right. And so it it can be just as manufactured and less creative than actually something that is technically virtual, but has this like dimension to it, has this depth, um, this creativity to it. And so I just wanted to double click on that, that like, I guess that relationship. Yeah. It's it's a question that's been been posed for a very long time. I think, you know, even since the emergence of like contemporary art, right? You have this this constant Mm -hmm. dialogue where it's like mom and dad walk into the museum and they're like, what are these scribbles? A three-year-old could do that. You know what I mean? (laughs) And then they walk in front of this like photo real landscape painting and they're like, now that, that's something I would pay for because they associate the ability to kind of like take an image from, you know, someone's eye and translate it onto a page with like craft and skill. And I think people are constantly doing the same, right? There aren't really good ways of understanding what is good and what is bad. It's so subjective that people are looking for concrete measures of what is good and what is bad. And authenticity is one that's been tossed around quite a bit. And I think people look for things that resonate as authentic and often associate them with like, they're playing an instrument, they have a craft or they're doing, and I think the reality is some of the most authentic things in the world to me are like K-pop, where it's entirely scripted and fictional, but it's presented in a super authentic way. It's saying like, hey, this is going to be so entertaining. We've plucked the most beautiful kids from Korean middle schools, give them the best choreographers and the best songs, and I've taught them to speak like Justin Timberlake. Like, you're going to love it. And there's, there's, there's no deception there. And I think that like young people resonate with that. I think it's harder for adults who've been who've been kind of primed on these ways of understanding contemporary art that, and, and I think as the technology evolves and ways of kind of like changing those rules evolve they feel very uncomfortable and fall back on the kind of like frameworks they understand yeah and actually these virtual influencers I think are biggest in Korea um, and parts of Asia which is interesting it's it's maybe a cultural thing maybe it's an age thing um, so yeah it's it's fascinating to I like that you use the word deception because we're all being deceived in ways and in terms of what's being put in front of us. But like we, we do fall back on these easy mechanics of like, is it real or is it not? Yeah, hundred percent. I think we talked about this early days of Rudd of like, nobody's going to like see a movie of Mickey Mouse for the early days and be like, Oh, this isn't real. How dare you guys try to pre- present this as real, <laughs> right? It's just too clear. Yeah. And when those lines start to get blurred, at least for those of us who like are used to something different, we have a lot of hangups or reactions to things or like misunderstandings of what they are. And to me, it all comes back to t- storytelling. It comes back to me thinking that storytelling is one of the most important things that we have as humans and the way we connect with others and the way that we evolve um, emotionally and all these other things. I think it's just one of the most unique things about us as animals that differentiates from anything else, right? And I think that enhancing our ability to tell those stories, especially with the, the world that I see coming, right? This more virtual world, this more inclusive, this three-dimensional spatial computing metaverse, whatever you call it, I view having digital humans be able to be able to tell those stories as an essential piece of that, right? And I want to help make that like look a certain way and feel a certain way and allow people to tell stories in this new way. So when you when you think of it that way, all this other stuff feels like noise, right? Well, yeah, I'm actually curious from both of you over the numerous years you've been doing this, what pushback did you see early on? And also, have you seen any of that pushback change? Like these ideas around ethics, what's real, what's not, should you be doing this? I mean, yeah, so many. The, that was part of like the, the premise though, is that like we were going to be first to the door and catch all the arrows. Like we, we were going <laughs> to <Yeah>. like <laughs> make all the mistakes quite publicly. But I think the really lovely part about that is that we get to kind of like set the tone for how these things are understood going forward. Like it was pretty clear that people were going to like leverage generative media, you know, virtual influencer, virtual characters to, you know, shape our reality. It's just like, it's, it, it, it's, it's too tempting not to. And so how do we go in and kind of like set some boundaries 
and some, some ways of behaving such that people follow in our path and kind of make things that are maybe more noble and righteous and other things that could have been done. Um, that said, some really obvious things. I mean, like, I think people were really concerned about virtual characters and people having accounts, right? Like, it seems quite silly now. Where they're like, wait a minute, how can this, like, fake person have a verified account? And at, at some point, you had to kind of extend that into, like, wait a minute, like, what is Coca-Cola if not a fiction and why do they have a blue check mark? There were interesting things in like startup land, like what was it, like startup L Jackson or like all these Twitter accounts that were like parodies. And so a lot of those things feel quite passe now. There are interesting conversations that I think are happening around AI, NFTs that feel very familiar to what we did, where it's like, this is new and scary and I don't like it. So I'm going to be upset about it, even though I'm like uninformed about it. And so I think that's going to be persistent forever as the Overton window shifts. But a lot of things that we did feel quite passe right now, where it was like a blue check mark next to your answer. You're like, yeah, that's fine. That's totally okay. <laughs> Trevor, what are some of those examples today? You mentioned like AI and NFTs, where you see that parallel, where back then it seemed strange, this idea of a blue check mark. What do you think, you know, in five to 10 years, we'll look back on some of the controversy today? Well, I, mean, I think the idea that like digital goods have value, right? It's not, I can totally understand why it seems silly. The right click save as thing makes a ton of sense. Until you think about, okay, if I have a, a wallet in, that, that's following me wherever I go on the internet and it effectively becomes the way I play status games, you know, it, it may be really important for me to have a digital asset that shows that I was there or I'm a part of this thing because it leads to IRL love or jobs or wealth or whatever it is. And so I think it's, it's probably going to be quite silly that we thought for a moment that like digital goods wouldn't have value. Much the same way, I'm sure it was really silly to see like luxury watches sold. We are like, what do you mean? That thing is the same thing my watch does. Why would you ever pay a markup for it? And it's like, well, because I get a, a handshake at the country club that I do, wouldn't get otherwise. You know, beyond that, I think with, with the AI stuff, people try to dunk on like the fingers thing or the eyes or like the hair looking wonky. And, and I don't think they recognize how quickly those things will get resolved. Much the same way for us early on, you know, they'd be like, wait a minute, this shadow is not real. Wait, this thing, you know, <laughs> oftentimes it was like, and totally real. Like, <laughs> and we matched it entirely. But, they, but we all, also, one of the things we had to do early on was like, add additional shadow to things or things like do things okay. to make people believe what they were seeing was real because the reality of the image wasn't real enough. As bizarre yeah. as that sounds, you had to kind of like mm -hmm. embellish. People, like once you look at an image and you're trying, trying to find what's fake, like you think everything's fake, right? And how many times the things that people called out were actually a photograph, a photographic element? Like they were real and people were convinced like, oh, this is the thing that doesn't look real. And the, the things that were CG, they were totally fine with. And I would say it was like 50-50, like half the time, it, like the things they complained about were an actual element that was from a photograph. Have you guys started doing that? Like whenever I see a picture on Twitter, someone will literally be just like taking a picture of their lunch or their house. And I'm like, I'm like trying to figure out if it's, generated by AI. I'm like, this isn't real. And it's totally a real picture. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing that for years. This, you know, like I've, I've been in VFX, right? So CG movies and like people always ask me and I can always tell because like the first thing you're actually doing is, is there any reason for them to use CGI, right? So like the first test that I can do that nobody else can do is like, of course, that's not CGI. And that would cost like 8 million extra dollars and there's no reason to do it. So there's no chance that it's CGI, right? But then there's a lot of other little tricks. Like once you get really familiar with the technology that you can see that maybe isn't. So one of the things that's actually hard for me is to try to step out of that and understand like what is the regular person seeing here like what are the, what is scaring them because it looks this way that's kind of hard to step in and out of i think the same thing for ai now i think artists especially have a really strong visceral reaction to it art community 3d art community that's really anti-ai because they're they have this fearful reaction that that's happened every time any new technologies ever happen that doesn't mean that i'm like dismissing any of their concerns it's this fearful reaction that my job's gonna be taken away or this other thing that i don't like is gonna happen etc so I think we're seeing that very strongly with AI right now. Yeah. And, and are you basically saying that you think in years, this will not be the case? Like, what do you think happens to, let's just use those like 3D animators, for example, like, what do you think either changes in their perspective or changes about the world? Well, I think right now what I'm thinking is that, look, the idea that you're going to like reject this and then it's just going to stop in this tracks is just the most wishful thinking thing I've ever, I can ever imagine, right? So the thing to do is try to like identify the parts of it that you don't agree with and try to figure out how can we make that better, right? So if it's rights to artist images that they create the artwork and they should get fractional like compensation or you should be able to like opt out of being having images, these are all very valid things. So again, I'm not like 
you know, dismissing any of them. It's just that there's a lot of people who are going to react so negatively. It's like, no, no to AI, like cancel all this stuff. And it's like, that's not going to happen. Even if that was the right move, if you, if you were right about that, it's not a realistic option. So what's the, you know, what's the positive thing we can do here to try to make this better? Well, on that note of positivity, I mean, the technology is advancing in many different ways. And so I'd love to hear both of your perspectives on how not just AI, but technology advancing as a whole may actually change our ability to create these virtual influencers. For example, might these influencers actually be able to engage with their audiences more, like use AI to actually like be the one responding, you like train an AI model based on this character, and they actually become like not a sentient being, but someone that's actually able to engage. That's one example. You could also imagine like a decentralized influencer where basically like not only is their worth distributed amongst a bunch of people, but actually like what they do, their narrative might be influenced by the people who have some sort of ownership over them. Trevor, why don't we start with you and just like any any ideas on how technology actually advances empowers our ability to create these these characters. I mean, I could do this for years, we could just riff, but <laughs> I mean, obviously the decentralized one is something that we're we you know, very excited about and you know, we're trying yeah. to build it dapper. You know, one thing I think about a lot is like why culture is not viewed as intellectual property and you know, you could almost mm-hmm. see influencers as kind of like these like rent-seeking middlemen that have like the aesthetics that allow them to like do a dance that was popularized by some six-year-old girl in the hood and capture a lot of the value yeah. that should have flowed back to that person, right? So I think the really challenging part with like culture and why it's, it's not intellectual property and why it's often you know caught in this crosshairs as being either like cultural appropriation or like unlicensable attribution is really hard and like remitting payments to the people that have that you've, you've identified as being a, a part of a culture or being owed for that, that you know using that representation. Um, and I think you know digital payments like you know blockchains right and i think that like tools that allow you to like quickly identify someone and and, and where that where they exist culturally but to me the idea that like you know as a black person you could identify a community and say like look all of this rad shit happening here has created value that we can like repatriate to your community i think that's really compelling you know for generations of people that watch elvis walk off the shit or the rolling stones or whatever else yeah. like it's sort of in the TikTok in dances and emotes. Like I would love to see like technology enable stuff like that. And so there's all kinds of stuff I could riff about, but like things like that to me are, are kind of exciting and maybe on the frontier. Totally. Isaac, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I think to me that the, there's three elements that I'm really excited about. One is, uh, and these are all amounts that are like of the metaverse to me, what the metaverse really is and it's persistence, right? So a character, a digital character, which to me is it's a brand. It's a, it's a, it's a living story. It's persistent. It doesn't exist in one single world anymore, right? So you don't have Drake from Last of Us existing just in a video game that people want to have them that one situation and then that's it. Like it starts to be able to go in any other medium instantly, right? So this persistence that that character actually has a history, a story, a life, and that that's there. It's synchronous, meaning you can actually interact with it. So that's kind of something you just mentioned there, where maybe you can go and talk to Nathan Drake. That's the simple thing. But I think there's a lot more interesting implementations of that as we move forward. And finally, it's interoperable. And that means like these, like kind of like what I said with persistence, these these walls that create barriers between different mediums and different things, they kind of go away. Like technology is an enabler and like a d- democratizing force. And I think what it's going to allow is for really compelling characters and brands and stories to, to be able to be told in really unique and, and, and new ways that in five years, we're going to look back today and be like, it seems obvious, but it doesn't feel obvious to a lot of people right now. Yeah. Something that's coming to mind is you mentioned synchronicity, but like the reason that celebrities can't interface with every one of their fans today is because like they are in meat space. Like they only have so much time. They need to sleep. They can only engage with so many of their fans, but actually technology can change that. Right. And that could be for the human celebrity who now just like has leverage through technology, but it also especially can be used for these virtual influencers where truly like they can have a relationship with their fans. Like the idea of being parasocial may maybe doesn't exist at some point because actually you're not just listening to people talk. You can actually like after a podcast, go have this virtual conversation with the podcast host. I don't know if I'm like extrapolating too far, but that just like dawned on me where I'm like, oh, actually. The limitation existed before because we didn't have technology. The first person I heard say, like, trying to, like, make this celebrity scalable was, like, from Trevor originally. I think we ran into problems with that with Michaela just because we were so early, right? Like, 
the expensive cost of creating animated content at this time was like, that wasn't really scalable, but I think we're getting to a point pretty quickly where it is. Sorry, go ahead, Trev. No, no, it's interesting. I think as, as we kind of thought about like that scalability and kind of what makes that experience exciting, you know, like is creating some type of scarcity important for making that thing mm. valuable is like yeah. to be defined, right? I think the variable rewards component of, 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 of social, that kind of like brain hack, the slot machine brain hack is what makes a lot of social experiences sticky. And so the idea that you could just, you know, message Emma Chamberlain and she responds right away or pop up on your screen might devalue you yeah, know, what Emma Chamberlain true. means to you. And this is all stuff that people are going to have to work through. And so it's going to be really interesting. Maybe an interesting question that I didn't have planned, but since we went down this rabbit hole, do you guys think that at some point we will have a virtual influencer that a religion is built around? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I never thought about it, but now that you mentioned it, I'm like, is it possible that with enough time goes by that it's not going to happen? I don't know. Like, It seems like at some point, yeah. I, I will say like problematic part of the pod potentially but our first employee at was a woman named Savannah Pekani. And I remember we were talking and she was like, you keep saying scalable celebrity, but like, what does that mean? Like, what does that look like? And I was like, Christ? Like, that's what it looks like to me. You know, like these narratives that have like, you know, shaped our reality because this figure has been able to touch people all over the world and, 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 and shape the way they behave. Some would argue that there are, you know, people in our current lives, Kardashians, whomever that have, you know, near, near like demigod power. And I, I have to imagine that at some point you'll have some, some thing that, that, that matches some of those traditionals. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some, it's, some of, some it's kind of mind gods. bending. No, I mean, you think about, we talked about like the sliding spectrums. It's like human to virtual or computer generated, but then it's also like, yeah, what, what, what is the sliding scale between listening to everything someone says to religion. But Trevor, Isaac, thank you so much for going through all this with us, for being early movers in this space and setting the tone, setting the boundaries, experimenting. Thanks for spending this time with me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the A16Z podcast. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube to get our exclusive video content. We'll see you next time.